Each year, millions of people visit the Upper Delaware Valley Corridor, but for most, its towering stone cliffs are nothing more than backdrop for Kodak moments. But to the eye of a trained geologist, the earliest history of the Delaware Valley is written here, among its stone. The rock formations comprising Delaware Water Gap and the valley to its north are three basic types. A shale environment called the Martinsburg Shale. The most predominant is the, the Schwangum or Schwangunk as it's spelled conglomerate, a very hard gray-like rock, and a sandstone known as the Bloomsburg Red Beds. They're the youngest of the three. More dramatic rock formations were formed by the effects of moving water and once again over the denominator of time, which is really the geologic underpinning of all this, hundreds of millions of years. The glaciers had their effect as well, although everything was formed by the time the glaciers have gotten here, they would have created these hill-like structures, drumlins, cames, cane terraces. Since the glacial age, wind and water have worked in slow harmony to carve rock formations in the Delaware Valley into natural works of art. This formation in the Delaware Water Gap area is known as Indian Rock, and for obvious reasons, this group near Mill Rift are known locally as the Elephant's Feet. Other sections take on the form of archways and castle turrets that seem to stand patient guard over the river below. It's the combination of moving water, wind, but also gravity pulling these rocks down, breaking them off at these very precipitous angles. An interesting uh, feature of the geologic process is the change of the seasons with uh, water in between the cracks of the rocks freezing breaking them apart, and then with the thaw, the rocks breaking off in very dramatic sequence. Just as we can read the geological formation of the Delaware Valley in the stones of its banks, we can also trace the roots of prehistoric vegetation. As for contemporary vegetation in the upper Delaware Valley, trees top the list branching out in a wide variety of species. Among the region's trees, white pines and sycamores stand tallest, but hemlocks, silver and red maples, and American elms can be found in the greatest numbers. The river is a very ecologically dynamic system, and vegetation is influenced to a large extent by water and ice. And so the trees that do well right in the river valley, on the banks, and in the floodplain are going to be those that uh, tolerate flooding on a regular basis and the scouring of, of ice in the wintertime. Uh, sycamore, uh, river birch, um, silver maple are examples of the trees that do well along the floodplain. Dry slopes along the river are home to a variety of oaks as well as sugar maples, cherry, and beech. Other species include black walnut, butternut, and hickory. Of the thousands of types of vegetation found in the Delaware River Valley, none have as strange a history as this brightly colored weed. Local legend has it that purple loosestrife was introduced to the valley as a packing material for crates of imported china, or mixed in with the ballast stones of trading ships, casually discarded into the river as trash. Seeds of the dried plants took root and remained long after the ships that brought them here were gone an alien species that is becoming a growing problem for contemporary botanists. Well, these species are really uh, the proverbial wolf in sheep's clothing. Purple loosestrife looks pretty, but uh, as it invades wetlands, uh, it crowds out one after another of the native plants, and the effects are felt on up the food chain, 
pretty soon wildlife habitat is degraded and purple loosestrife and Japanese knotweed are two of a handful of really bad weeds that uh, pose a serious threat to the region's biological diversity. The life along the Upper Delaware Corridor is more than just trees and weeds. When we come back, we're going to look at just what lives on and below the surface of the Delaware River.